still very much in our minds, given the horrific news from Las Vegas. All of us here in the studio are sending out you our thoughts, prayers and condolences. We've been watching the story unfold on our TV news. And TV news is something we're going to be discussing today. Specifically, Rupert Murdoch's Fox and the trouble it's having trying to take over British broadcaster Sky. We'll also be discovering what it's like to cut yourself off from the rest of the world for nine months solid, all in the name of space exploration. And we'll be talking quiz shows and quizzes from a quintessentially British perspective. To discuss all this and more with me in the studio here in London are the UK's most popular quiz show host, author and TV producer, Richard Osman. Hello, Richard. Hello, Narina. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Space researcher and emergency medicine MD, Dr. Beth Healy. Hello, Beth. Hello. Hi. The Financial Times' global media editor, Matthew Garahan. You've just moved back here after 11 years in the States, is that right? That's right. Yeah, I've been back for about six weeks. Ah, oh, welcome back. Thank and you. joining us today, too, is film and television investor, Danny Cohen, who as head of BBC Television was responsible for shows such as Doctor Who and Call the Midwife, and is currently executive producing the latest J.K. Rowling movie. Danny is also my husband. Hello, well, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's my show and I like having my husband on it Some when he can uh, join. Chemistry between yeah. the two of you yeah. is electric. <laughs> it is, really is. Crackling in the sweet air. of you to say, sweet yeah, of you. Quite something. You're happy to be here, aren't you, Danny? I'm very happy to be here and with such interesting, eclectic guests as well. Mm. Great. But first, Beth spent 14 months in the Antarctic, the bleakest, most remote place on Earth. I'm really looking forward to discussing this with you, Beth, later. And it got me thinking, if you had to spend 14 months somewhere, where would it be? Danny. 14 months in one place. Yes. Um, Quick fire. I think I'd, it would either be the bench for Liverpool Football Club, soccer club. I'd like to be sitting there watching lots matches. Or if I could go back in time, I'd like to sit with Charles Dickens in his study and watch him work. Oh, 14 oh, months oh, watching 14 months. him work. Yeah. Watching him write, that's something you've already read. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wouldn't have read it if I'd gone back in time because it wouldn't have been published yet. No, but you would have oh. gone back in time from now. Yeah, but I but wouldn't But you'd have been suggesting stuff to him as well. You Richard, say, you know that, what, where would you How about the best of go? times, the worst of times, Charles? First where, time. I would say, where would you um, go? I'm really, I, I don't really like leaving the house if I can avoid it. So I would stay, if I had to be somewhere for 14 months, if I really had to, I would stay at home because I know it. I, I've got my broadband is all set up. Um, I've got Deliveroo, I've got all those services. So if I have to be somewhere for 14 months, like prison, because it's essentially what you're talking about, mm. I would stay at home, I think. Richard, that is mm. very exciting. Mm. Matthew. The beach, perhaps. Mm. Be a, I am with months. you. Yeah, yeah. Tropical beach wins hands down, no shoes, mm. no mobile phones, mm. no emails. Careful of the sun. I'd be careful of the sun, please. Freezing at night. Absolute mm. bliss. Someone who isn't in absolute bliss right now, though, is Rupert Murdoch, mm. whose plan mm. to take over Sky, Sorry. one of our biggest broadcasters, has potentially been thwarted by our government, mm. basically because it's got problems with how Fox is run. One of the issues it has with Fox is that over here, broadcasters are required to report the news in a balanced, fair and impartial way. If Fox were to own Sky, there are legitimate concerns that they would not uphold these standards. Mm. Listeners, do you wish your news had to be fair, balanced and impartial? I want to hear from you. So call me toll free on 877-974-7487. Tweet me on SXM Insight or share your thoughts on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash Narina Hertz. So with me to discuss the Fox Sky deal as the Financial Times is Matthew Garahan, who's been closely following Murdoch's machinations yeah. for the past 12 years. I look forward to unpacking all this story with you shortly, Matthew. But before we launch into a discussion about Fox, yeah. there's another US giant that's currently under fire here, Uber, which 10 days ago lost its license to operate in London due to concerns that it's neither fit nor proper. Yeah. Tomorrow, its CEO, Dara Khosrowshahi will be coming here to plead his company's case. Now, I like how this guy's coming across. He's apologised. He seems humble. 
and I use Uber a lot and it really has made getting around London cheaper and easier. But as a company, there's a lot that jars, especially when it comes to worker rights, customer safety. Danny, we were together when that news broke. We both took a sharp intake of breath. What do you make of it? Well, I have mixed feelings about it because I use it a lot and find it convenient, but I can also see that it, it's a, a troubled corporation that doesn't always behave in the right way. I think the thing I found most interesting about it was it was a government body really taking on one of the tech giants. And this is something we've not seen enough of, in my view, um, and something we need to see more of. It's a strong feeling, and it's something I think you know we've talked about on this show before, that these companies have such power, but often without a lot of responsibility. Mm. Um, and another example of it that I think troubles people in the UK and Europe a lot is the amount of tax they pay. They pay very low levels of tax and are taking a lot of money out of the country and profits in one way or another. So to see actually a government body stand up to one of the big tech giants and say, actually, you're not doing a good enough job. We're not. It's not accepted. I actually rather appealed to me, but I'd still would like to keep my Uber app working. Because mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, the company's greedy. You know, they need to put their house in order. They need to give workers better rights. They need to deliver on customer safety. They made six and a half billion dollars in revenue last year. You would think that they could spend a bit more of that, a bit more of that on, um, on, on these things. Now, I don't want to dwell more on Uber, but I want to turn to the other big US story uh, right now, the big US company in the news, Rupert Murdoch's Fox, mm. which is trying to take over our biggest pay TV broadcaster, Sky, and the British government isn't just waving this through. Matthew Garahan, mm. as the Financial <laughs> Times' global media editor, you are following this story closely. Mm. What's going on? So Rupert Murdoch and his Fox empire already own a, quite a big chunk of Sky. Rupert actually launched Sky in 1989. It's a tremendously successful company, um, does very well at what it does, has lots and lots of subscribers, but he wants to own the whole thing. And the problem with owning the whole thing is that it means he and his family own the whole thing. And they tried to buy it once before a few years ago and withdrew their, their offer in the face of huge opposition around the phone hacking scandal, which you may remember, mm. and I'm sure some of your American listeners may remember too. Um, so this was when our newspapers right. were hacking into celebrities. Celebrities and, 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 other, and other people. And the, other the, people. The, the scandal blew up when it emerged that a murdered schoolgirl had had her phone messages hacked by... The News of the World, which is was Murdoch's big tabloid newspaper. So fast forward to now, Murdoch is, and his company have cleaned up their act and they've come back again for, a, for another go. Except this time, their bid has coincided with this quite appalling scandal at Fox News with sexual harassment and allegations of all sorts of un unsavory behavior that had the company cleaned up its act in the way they said they had four or five years ago, presumably wouldn't have happened Again, so the question is, can they be trusted to do the things that they say they're going to do? And that's raised some concerns within within the UK government. So are they are they fit and proper? Yeah. Um, but also, are they impartial? That seems to be an issue as well that some people are concerned about because Fox News, um, I mean, I think they've dropped the fair and balanced mm. tagline now, but it never was fair and balanced. Yeah. But it's interesting if you, they, 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 their argument here, and they're not here as well. I'll, I'll tell you what their argument is because okay. they often Go call on. me and shout about about it when I when I write this. If you describe them as a right wing network or as a conservative network, they call me up and they say, "Don't be ridiculous." You know, our opinion commentators between in our prime time broadcast hours are very right wing. Well, they haven't. They're an opinion, they're, but their opinion shows. In the same way, you'll have an opinion section in, in the newspaper, and their straight news coverage between nine and five or nine and six is down the middle, balanced and fair. It doesn't sound right, very but true. It, and in prime time, that's, and that's in, what they say. And, and as soon yeah. as they're in prime time, it isn't at all. As soon as in prime time, all better off. It's uh, <laughs> all better off. You, you kind of wonder if you're living on another planet when you watch those those three prime time rounds. Listeners, um, do you wish your TV news was actually fair, balanced, and impartial like ours is? Um, call me toll free on eight seven seven nine seven four seven four eight seven. Tweet me on SXM Insight or share your thoughts on Facebook Live at Facebook dot com slash Narina Hertz. I mean, I mean if you if you as a Brit watching Fox News when mm -hmm. I'm there, 
when you watch the morning show, for example, yeah. when you hear Trump come on and he seems to phone in quite often. Yeah, Fox and, uh, that's Fox and Friends. Yeah, yeah, which is the sort of the breakfast show, isn't it? There's no way you would say that the interview they give him. No, that, they would count that as being in the opinion block. That's opinion, okay. So it's between the, the early morning. It's basically when most people are watching. The mornings, okay. when on the, people are on the way to work and the evenings when they get home. Those are the... Because over here, because I, I worked in broadcast news over here till recently, and when you're on TV news here, you just... You're not allowed to be political. You can't be partisan. Everything you report has to be fair and balanced and impartial. You can't even, you can't even tweet mm. any political views. You can't espouse any political opinion in any forum. It's why a whopping 90% of us trust our news. Mm. Although, you know, if you look at any social media, there's an obsession in Britain now from the right and from the left that the BBC even is biased and terribly biased. And the BBC is either incredibly right wing or incredibly left wing, depending on your um, perspective. Mm. Uh, you know, and Laura Kunzberg, who's the, the BBC's chief correspondent, had to have a bodyguard at the Labour Party conference because they hate her so much. And, it, you know, when you look at Fox News, you do think, how can you watch the BBC News and think it is mm. extraordinarily biased? Because mm. you, the complaints they get are almost uh, exactly the same from both sides. I know, Danny, I mean, you, you ran BBC television, so you have kind of insight into this. Is that right? Do you tend to, the BBC is sometimes criticised, well, it's criticised by the right as being too left wing, it's criticised yeah. by the left as being too right wing. Yeah. And you see that on specific issues as well, like Israel-Palestine. You know, you see both sides feeling that the, the presentation of the Middle East is biased one way or the other. Um, you saw around the Scottish referendum where both parties, the, the nationalists and the pro-unionists, were saying that the coverage was biased against them. I mean, me, in my experience there, I, I wasn't even allowed to tweet on a personal level anything that had any sense of political uh, political bias to it. Really wasn't really meant to tweet anything that had anything related to the news in case it showed the BBC was biased in favour of one attitude or another, which is, of course, very different. And it's a different set of standards. Yeah. Well, it used but, to be, uh, America yes, used to be like this. Understand. So, what so, happened? So go back, to, go back to 1987, and Ronald Reagan, the Ronald Reagan administration, abolished this thing called the Fairness Doctrine, which was basically a, a statutory requirement that every, if you were presenting a political opinion of any sort on, on over the airwaves that were controlled by the by the by the government, so over on radio or on television, you had to have the opposing view and had to be presented in a factually balanced and impartial way. So much more like our news is right. governed. So they they ripped this up because they said it was holding back the development of TV news, holding back you know the commercial growth of of media and of the news, and you end up with this kind of with talk radio, and you end up with Rush Limbaugh. I'm on talk radio. But, but right talk, now, talk radio, we're all on talk radio. But, but Rush, you know, <laughs> we, we can't overstate the, the, the sort of the sway and the clout that someone like Rush Limbaugh has, or that Fox News has. I mean, millions of people listen to these 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 stations and watch Fox, and their view, their worldviews are shaped by them. And you can draw a line, I think, between that decision and between the election of Donald Trump. I mean, it's clear that it amplified certain voices in a way that that weren't being amplified before. Sure. But is it, is it fair to put such high standards on television news in an age of social media? Is it not a bit anachronistic? It is, but I still, you know, again, coming back, being immersed in this for so long in the States and then coming back here, it is like, it's com incredibly refreshing to see the BBC do what the BBC does very, you know, particularly well. And to see an argument being, both sides of an argument being explained and discussed and the way that it is here, because it's just, it's kind of ridiculous sometimes over there. I, I think the, I agree with you in the context of news. Mm. I think some areas of other areas of standards that we have here and actually uh, network television in the States has, you know, nudity and so on on network television in the States is becoming increasingly anachronistic and ridiculous mm. because, you know, we're all looking at watching things on the same screens. Mm -hmm. You've got BBC One here or ABC or CBS in the States not being able to show a nipple. Well, uh, the but Janet then Jackson you can, Super Bowl controversy, yeah. the, the most, the largest fine ever in a But then you can network. flick on with one button to the internet and watch any kind of, <laughs> you know, pornography that you would oh, want yeah. to choose. Yeah. So so the idea, or you would want to choose, <laughs> yeah. which, I, won't, I, won't, I won't ask you which you'd like to choose, yeah. but, the, but it seems weird increasingly anachronistic that the internet has such very different standards that than television broadcasters and networks are held to but i think it's you know it's, it's the same with with facebook right i mean face you have very tight regulation of political advertising on mm. over the air in this country and in the, and in the u.s and facebook was open up for grabs you know yeah. the russians bought ads on facebook and nobody knew and you have possible swaying of an election so that it is the wild west but right. i think that there are 
get the sense that that's changing now. Callers, so do you feel it sounds like an island of calm, fairness? Um, the UK, where our news has to be, our TV news has to be fair, balanced, mm. and impartial. Do you wish your news was like that? Call me toll free on 877-974-7487. Tweet me on SXM Insight or share your thoughts on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash Narina Hertz. Um, back to the US. There's another difference um, that I'm really struck by every time I'm in the States and I was just in the States last week, um, which is when you watch TV, drug companies can <laughs> advertise on television, which I find really strange. I find it particularly strange because it seems that most of the ad is the side effects of the drug treatment. So it's kind of, you know, this will help you go to the toilet better, but in the it may process, kill you. Yeah, yeah. Basically, <laughs> Beth, as a doctor, what do you think? Do you think that that it's okay that patients are being advertised to? On television, that the drug companies are advertising to us directly, or should we? Be, should it all be happening through the trusted doctor? <laughs> um, I think it's good that patients are informed about their healthcare, and I think definitely sort of healthcare in general is moving more towards that model. So in the UK, um, sort of patients are actively encouraged to sort of take ownership of, of their medical care, um, and I think it produces much better results because there's no point in somebody going to the doctor, being given some medication, and then them going home and not taking it because they don't sort of believe in in what they've been told. So I think there's definitely no harm in that. Um, I guess the problem does come when you're sort of advertising certain drugs um, and perhaps misrepresenting um, what they're able to do for people, giving them sort of unrealistic expectations um, about curing things as well. And certainly, even within the medical profession in the UK, there's huge restrictions on the advertising that healthcare um, and pharmaceutical companies can do. So when I was a medical student, we used to sort of have sort of free lunches and things from pharmaceutical companies, which has oh. now all been stopped completely. And do you um, think it did affect what what people prescribed? I think it can do. I mean, if you're sort of, I don't know, Christmas party is being sponsored by a certain drug company, it certainly does give good exposure and probably does have um, some sort of element of increasing the sales within that company, which now we don't have, I think brings much more impartial um, sort of decision making, which is certainly the case. Um, we've got David on Twitter who's joining the conversation. David says, if the left and the right hate you, you're doing it right. I think that's true. Or left. Yeah. Or left. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing it right or left. But I, I, I think that's true because I think it means you're hopefully getting it somewhere in the middle if, if both sides have got reasons to attack you. I had a, a rare mm -hmm. insight into the BBC um, complaints process when uh, the quiz show that I do over here called Pointless got the most complaints of a, a particular month. For Pointless is a something huge or other. quiz show that's in it's It's done a thousand episodes. It's, it's just, it, sound, it seems like 15,000. It's, my it's mum's been a lot. favourite show. <laughs> <laughs> it was everyone's yeah. mum's favourite show. But we had like kind of 5,000... My, my mum likes you as well, Rich. Uh, that's very kind. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of your mum. Yeah. Uh, and uh, second and third Hi. on the list were, were complaining about the views about Palestine, 1,500 complaints, complaining about the views about Israel, 1,470 complaints. Right. And you think, that's neck and neck. Yeah. You know, that's, you, you know what can you do? That's, yeah. That to me sounds, seems like you're doing a perfect job. Well, the Jews were 30 mm. behind there, so I think they need to get their act together. Uh, they should do, shouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. 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 It was a Friday. Yeah. Yeah. It was a Friday. Ads. Yes. Matthew, mm, sorry. what was your, would you have something to... Well, I just thought, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it does reach ludicrous extremes in, in the States because, um, you know, as you say, there are these horrendous disclaimers about, you know, you take this drug, it'll solve your, all of your woes and, and then the sort of the... And it's usually sped up as well. There'll be a, there'll be a, a rapid fire explanation of the side effects that could, could kill you. Um, but the, what I was going to... Thinking about when you, when you brought it up was the... Um, you know, it, it fuels itself. So we have ads for super strong opioid painkillers and now an opioid crisis in the United States mm. with people dying all over the place. Mm. Um, and now drugs to, to affect to, for people to take that are being marketed in this way on, on television um, to cure the, effect, the side effects of taking opioids. The big one at the Super Bowl last year, the most expensive airtime anywhere in the world because the whole country is watching the Super Bowl, um, was an, an ad for a pill which cured um, opioid-induced constipation, right? This was the big, people were stunned that this was being oh advertised. Oh my gosh, that was the ad. And, and it was, wow. this was in prime time, watched wow. by 130 so million people. how many people had the problem. Pe millions of people yeah. suffering from this. The, yeah. If you have yeah. the name of that drug, it's just uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I'll, 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 I'll get it for you. That's yeah. too much information. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, but thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Mm. Uh, listeners, if you want to keep abreast of what Matthew's thinking, mm. you can read him in the Financial Times or reach him directly mm. on Twitter at Matt Garahan. Now, from Fox News to snowshoes. Oh, I can see what you've done there. I can see what you've done there. Classic. Yeah. That's, good. Oh, that's very good. And Dr. Beth Healy, an incredible woman who spent 14 months in isolation at the Concordia Station in Antarctica, researching the impact of space travel on astronauts' bodies and minds. Can I just say, because this is a radio show, so you have no idea, Beth, you do not look like you do not look like the person I would imagine. I mean, Beth is like really slight, really pretty, really you know just 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 looks like the go kind on, of girl you can see. I don't know. Maybe I've got some kind of awful stereotype view of you what space You wouldn't know from looking at her that she's got constipation like. from opioids. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't. You honestly wouldn't know. Would you? She hides it very well. I've been taking the drug. Though, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Very good. Well done. So, Beth, what makes Antarctica such a good place to replicate space? Um, so the reason that we use Concordia as a station, so it's one of the three inland stations in Antarctica. Um, because of that, the temperatures during the winter time are really cold, so it's about minus 80 Celsius. Um, and also, which we, is minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a bit nippy, isn't so it? Pretty, yeah. pretty chilly. Yeah. Um, it's and cold it, weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for Londoners, maybe not. But um, and then the other thing is, um, we go for three months without any sunlight as well. So during that period, during the overwinter, um, it means that the crew there are completely isolated, um, even in case of emergency. So if we're to have a medical problem, planes can't fly in because of the low temperatures. Um, and because of that, it's a really good um, model for long duration spaceflight of the future. So um, you, you might already be aware that um, ESA and NASA are looking at going further away. ESA is the European Space. Agency. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, so on the sort of global exploration roadmap, um, it outlines the fact that we're really looking to go on more exploratory missions, so first to do a moon village um, and then going to Mars. And if we have a medical problem on the International Space Station at the moment, we can evacuate astronauts within kind of half a day. Um, but as we're going further away, that's going to change. And as a result, the sort of psychological, physiological challenges and the medical models that we need um, are changing, which is why we're using places like Concordia. Um, where the crew are isolated to study that. Because there's some other, I was reading up on this whole area of these places that replicate yep. space, and there was this Mars 500 experiment where <laughs> these poor people seem to stay in a car park in yeah. Russia for Absolutely. a very long time in a car. Is that right? Yeah, and I know one of the guys that was um, involved in it. Yeah, it's a really interesting study. I mean, Concordia is very different to that. Um, but it was, so it's essentially sort of a mock-up spaceship which was put in a, yeah, a Russian car park and they sealed the door for 500 days. Um, but it's a very different kind of model to Concordia. So for that one, they were very much sort of, you know, they sort of were astronauts uh, to all intents and purposes. And it was very much like a simulated mission to Mars. So halfway through, they kind of did a Mars spacewalk um, and they were actually like in a kind of mock-up spaceship. Um, whereas in Concordia, um, it's different because you're just kind of living on an Antarctic station. Um, but the difference is during Mars 500, of course, it's, it's sort of an artificial isolation. So if they have a medical problem or something, we can actually evacuate them quite quickly, um, which you don't have at Concordia, which means um, you're not able to do the same kind of stuff. So you're not able to sort of simulate emergencies and that sort of thing on a station like Concordia, mm -hmm. which you can um, on Mars 500. Listeners, if you were isolated for 14 months in the Antarctic, cut off from the world, <laughs> what would you miss most? Wow. I'd love to hear what you think. So call me toll free on 877-974-7487, tweet me on SXM Insight, or share your thoughts on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash Narina Hertz. Beth, why did you do it? Good question. Mm. Great question. Um, I guess, well, I've had a background of working as part of medical logistical support teams in remote environments before that, because I'm a big skier, so it kind of escalated, to be honest. So I'd worked a lot in sort of Greenland, Svalbard, North Pole, um, doing skiing, essentially, um, but also medical support. And I met lots of people that have been to Antarctica. And I guess it just kind of was something I was interested in doing. And 
when I was a student as well, I got to go to the astronaut center for sort of a space medicine course. So I, I've always been interested in space and, and I'm really excited about sort of long duration space flight in the future and our mission to Mars. And it's nice to be sort of one small part of that um, with the research that we're doing at Concordia. Are you well. allowed to watch box sets and stuff when you're there? <laughs> yeah, like lots of box sets. I got all the way through Downton Abbey and, and oh, various others. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. You're climbing the walls at the end by that. That's it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but can I just say, you know, 14 months in the snow and the darkness, Sounds a little bit like the setup to The Shining. Uh, yeah, we right? did watch The Shining. We did. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not dark the whole. So during the summertime, it's like um, twenty-four hour daylight actually. So it's which kind is of, also which is also <laughs> pretty stressful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting environment to be in. How does that lack of sunlight? I think that is, how does it affect you? How does it affect people? Well, that was one of the studies we were doing, actually, it was looking at the effect of that on your sleep. And I'd spent a lot of time up in the Arctic um, in the sort of 24 hour sunlight. Um, and I'd always been fine because you can kind of shut off um, the darkness or you can make it dark sort of artificially. Um, but when the um, when the 24 hour darkness came in, I had so much problems with sleeping. So I probably spent like the first three days sleeping completely. Um, and then I was up for the next week and like it really does affect you. And, and it was pretty tough to kind of because you didn't really it was funny. You didn't really like wake up in the morning. It's kind of you know, when you sort of wake up and you go outside, it sort of really wakes you up, but you don't really have that kind of stimulation. And I'd be working like four in the morning and then asleep at lunchtime. And what did things. you miss the most? <laughs> Obviously my friends, but mm. um, I guess fresh fruit and vegetables and things. I mean, like avocado. And did you have to mango. eat that weird spaceman powdered stuff that we see in the films? No, we actually had like an Italian chef. The food was pretty, wow. it wasn't too nice. bad. <laughs> now it's all coming wow. out. Yeah. Now it's all coming yeah. out. Definitely no spaceman yeah. ice cream. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I can't wait to hear more about this and I still want to hear more from you. Listeners, if you were cut off from the world, what would you miss? Call me toll free on 877-974-7487. Tweet me on SXM Insight or share your thoughts on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash Narina Hertz. We're now going to take a short break. When we're back, we'll find out more about life on White Mars. Plus, we'll be talking to Richard Osman, a huge star in the UK, about the strange things us Brits get very interested and excited about in his life as a game show creator and host. Sounds very good. Thank you. We are okay. in break. We have a three minute break. Ooh. Well done, everyone. That was interesting. Wow. That's crazy, Beth. <laughs> I know. Is it? I read <laughs> about you and I just thought, oh my God, you have to. I have to be on the show. How many of you were, were, were in the crew? Wait, don't all ask her because we're, oh, gonna yeah. be, we're coming back to her. Hold we're coming the, back to her. Hold the go. Fantastic. We got about about two and a half minutes at this point.
this point, we have just over one minute till we're back. And now we are... Now it's one minute. Facebook. <laughs> To anyone listening on Facebook, mm -hmm. hi, we're back. We're just about to go on air. So we're all getting ready. We have to stop what we were just saying. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 30 seconds. Really juicy. Just we were juicy. all oh. be imprisoned within minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sounds yeah. very good, Norina. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That, who was speaking to me? That was Roy. Hello, Rory. It's James the board out. Oh, no, it's Rory James. gives Sorry. his best as well. Sorry, oh. Ten seconds. <laughs> James and Rory. Too many the same people time. in it. Ten seconds. Mm -hmm. America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'll be that'll be what it is. It's the time difference. New York. Yeah. New York. Live from London, you're listening to Megahertz London Calling with your host, Norena Hertz, on Sirius XM Inside 121. Welcome back to the show that puts a European spin on the big stories of the day. Let's get straight back to Antarctica with Dr. Beth Healy, who spent 14 months isolated there for research. Beth, you weren't alone though, were you? You were the crew on a mission together. Did you get on with the others? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we were a crew of 13 for the nine months, which is the, the main isolation period. Um, and before we went, we actually went to the European Astronaut Center and had sort of human behavior performance training, which is done by the, the crew there. Um, well, which hold on. <laughs> people need human behavior training. I think I could do with that. Yeah. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah. What do you learn on human behavior training? I mean, it's a lot of sort of, you know, team skills, learning about yourself um, and how you sort of cope in sort of when you're upset in different situations. Um, and just your crew also getting an awareness of how you might react to different different things. Um, but all astronauts have that before they go up into space as well. And it's the same team that gave us the training for Antarctica. Whose idea was it to send 13 people? Because to me, to my mind, that's, uh, that's <laughs> Unlucky problems, number. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, for months and months in Antarctica, on they sent 13 of them. Yeah. But did that include... <laughs> what could go was it on a yeah. Friday? I, I can't remember. <laughs> the setup to a horror film. Was that, that include the Italian chef? That does. He does include. <laughs> so he's in the thirteen. Person. Yeah, okay. yeah. Did he have the survival skills tra you... training the, sh the Italian chef? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Everyone has. Oh, it. Tell you what, were, yeah. there, were there any <laughs> romances? Um, it was funny. I mean, there were a couple, but it's really it's. <sighs> It's Ooh. funny, during the summertime, Antarctica is very famous for that. I think during the wintertime, people are a lot more cautious. Well, but the same person you've had the summer fling with, you're then stuck <laughs> with for I'm months with. in the dark. <laughs> well, exactly. That's why the winter crews are much more cautious, because I think, yeah, I mean, you can't really... So do. people are much hotter in the dark, aren't they? And then suddenly it comes to summer, you think, oh, I didn't know. Oh, yes. now, now I see you in actual light. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I can see you, full stop. People yeah. do say that. So you know how you sort of say how many pints for a person? People say how many sort of months for a person? No, so really. Similar. Yeah. Oh, that is good. Can you imagine but, um, Mars? Imagine the first romance on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Did anyone think of writing a murder mystery? Well, I don't know. Matt must... Damon, though, if he's. he's oh, yeah, on Matt Damon Mars, would be there. Yeah, I wouldn't take any pints. Or imagine, if there yeah. Was a, yeah. imagine if there was a Caledonia <laughs> if baby. Matt Damon is listening. Yeah. <laughs> if Healy yeah, is a fan. Um, do people go weird when they're stuck together for so long? You do see some interesting behavior, I guess. And for me, that was the, the sort of fun of it, really. Um, I remember sort of halfway through the winter, one person was sort of hiding food in the roof. Um, and that was... Were well, you not? Know, was the Italian <laughs> chef yeah. withholding food? I know, it wasn't the chef, ironically. Um, but, you know, you just sort of... I mean, that why, was... Why were they hiding food? Um, because you can't get any more food. So um, they're actually hiding all the good food. So like the lint chocolate and the tonic Sounds water. like Big Brother. <laughs> mm, it really does. It's like a reality it's a lot show. It's like yeah. Big Brother. <laughs> Um, but I mean, you don't have sort of big arguments that you might expect um, because, again, it's it's sort of, um, you know, people don't want to be perceived as causing problems because um, you're sort of all trapped and isolated there. Did anyone so. drop out? Well, you can. That's the thing. I think a few people would have liked to it. But <laughs> oh, you can't because you can't get out. You yeah, physically absolutely. can't yeah. get yeah. out. Oh, so, um, oh, for me, this is, this is such a it. nightmare. I can't even drive on a motorway or highway because that's giving up too much control. <laughs> so, yeah. so, 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 I mean... So being stuck, stuck somewhere where you can't leave. When I saw the last plane leave, it was yeah, it was a pretty emotional time because you just realised that you're actually stuck there for all that time. What about downtime when you weren't doing 
experiments and what you know you can't exactly go and play tennis or go for a walk can you so what, what, yeah, what, what did you do I mean there's quite a lot to do so um I got into photography I suppose and um, was the main thing that I was doing out there um but... here's a picture of some snow <laughs> here is some more snow <laughs> here's a picture me. of the dark yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a picture of a, or a polar like bear and some snow yeah, yeah. 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 there's snow in the dark well, yeah. polar bears. Those are, this those is are some uh, this is some food <laughs> in yeah, the yeah, so, right. no polar bears. Trick, trick question turns out but there are lots of, well, there are no penguins at Antarctica. Uh, well, sorry, there are in Antarctica, but not a Concordia because um, because of the temperatures are so cold. So you only find those actually at the coast. So that was one of the experiments we were doing because actually no life survives there, even bacteria. So um, I was looking to find any sort of extremophile bacteria out there. Beth, what was the oddest thing you did? Oh, good question. I guess I joined the 300 Club, which is where you Hold basically... On <laughs> <laughs> Steady on. It's more of a show. Yeah. side pole thing but um you go from the sauna at like plus 90 and then you sort of run outside into minus 80 and have to run around the station naked um i had my boots <laughs> yeah, of course you did so, yeah. yeah you don't want to get cold feet yeah. Yeah. it's the last thing you want yeah. that's like um, a midwinter um, thing what did you what did you most miss you said your friends and family but what else did you miss yeah, you just miss doing like normal stuff, like again, like going running just like outside and getting fresh air. I think that for me was the biggest thing because, of course, when you go outside, you have to wear loads of gear. So it's actually quite claustrophobic. Um, and so it's kind of the inverse of going outside when you're in the UK because, you know, when you go outside, you get that like fresh air feeling. Whereas when you were, went back inside because you could take off all your mask and everything, it was kind of the opposite way around. Um, but yeah, I mean, you miss a lot, like, um, but there's also sort of new things to experience. Richard, well. what would you miss? Gosh, if I was in Antarctica. Yes, which that, is not your house. <laughs> yeah, it, gosh, it really isn't. What would I miss? All sorts of things. Well, it is, for, it's, you know, it's friends and, uh, and family, isn't it, is, 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 is the worst thing. But yeah, I would miss kind of TV. I'd miss going to see Fulham, which is my soccer team. I'd miss, um, yeah, cinema and just new stuff happening all the time i have to right? say I, I, uh, Danny. I, I, well i admire you so much but it absolutely sounds horrific yeah, <laughs> it really does i mean it really uh, you know all power to you you know you've come out of it you're living breathing in front of us but the yeah. idea of being in the dark for three months not being able to get out stuck with the same people it sounds like television's most horrific game show yeah uh so i admire you massively for it i i think well i obviously miss my wife if she wasn't there with me the Aww. most that'd be the main thing but then actually weirdly similar to, to richard television and football i know it's funny yeah. isn't it it's the little day those daily routines the yeah. things that um yeah it's how so close awesome. a second is football can i just think can <laughs> i just just be clear mm. do you want to discuss this on air yeah. or do you discuss it later? <laughs> second. um uh, matthew what would you miss? I'd miss my ki my kids. Oh, oh. Being too schmaltzy. No. No, we're and my, all, and we're my all wife. Being how old How old are they? My, uh, they are eleven and eight and eight. Oh, you wouldn't miss that much. Yeah. Yeah. You got twins. I have twins. Oh, yeah. They'd be good for an experiment in yeah. 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 Twins, yeah. Are, twins on Mars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. twins on Mars. All right, yeah. Beth. At that note, before you're being sent to experiment on Matthew's children, <laughs> well, I just wanted to <laughs> thank Helly. They're, they're available, by the way. For, for, <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Thank you so much. And stay abreast of Beth's news. You can follow her on at Beth A. Healy. Great. Finally, we are joined by one of the tallest and smartest men on British television. Mm. My erstwhile Scrabble opponent. Yes. Richard Osman. Absolutely. Richard, Hello. why did we stop playing? We were playing Scrabble online virtually. Had we even met? I don't Is think it, we had, no. We hadn't met, but we... We I don't played. think we had. Yeah, I think you just sent me a series of very rude words, and I just thought, "This is come on, this is a bit much." I don't know. I think maybe once you just didn't start a game against me, I assumed I'd offended you in some way or other, and uh, and we stopped. We must start again. I'm very comfortable doing that. I would like. To. Who, who, who won these games? Just out of interest. Hmm. I'm going to say Norina won them. I'm actually relieved if you would do that because <laughs> Norina is so much better than me at Scrabble. It's, it's an embarrassing me, waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> it's an embarrassing waste of time. So, and I think you would be, I remember you're very good at crosswords. And I think you'd be a very good opponent for us. So please, I'd be grateful right. if you could. We, will, okay, we, we can do that. Yes, right. so, yeah. mm -hmm. so you are a very successful quiz show host here. You're also creative director of the TV production company Endemol, who makes, amongst other shows, Big Brother, MasterChef, The Biggest loser 
Mm. And you're also an author. So <laughs> can we start with your new book, Course World we can. Cup yes. of Everything? Can you quickly explain what the World Cup of Everything is yes, and how came, it got so popular? It, well, it was a very organic thing on, 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 on Twitter. I mean, British people are obsessed with, um, with snacks. And so I just did a World Cup of Chocolate, which is what's your favourite chocolate bar in the UK? And you could vote. I just thought, oh, this would be a bit of fun. Uh, and uh, launched it on Twitter and had two million votes, this thing. <laughs> and, you know, people were going crazy. And, and one of the big betting companies over here, Betfair, ran a book on it and it made a fortune. And I worked very closely with a charity uh, in Uganda called Child's Eye. And they donated all of their profits to that. And it raised a lot of money for Child's Eye. So I thought, oh, I'll do this again. So we did the World Cup of Crisps, which is another thing that Brits Potato are chips. obsessed with. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, yeah, yes. chips, uh, which we have an, an awful lot of. Uh, and again, two million votes and raised, raised, raised a fortune. And I did biscuits or cookies, you might say. Uh, so I've done all of these things. And then I thought, well, people, you, you would do them and, you know, it, it would come out on the Tobler and would be the winning chocolate bar and people would go, oh, no, but that's not right. You think, well, we've just decided. We just decided. Did, and I go, did no, Toblerone not... actually win? Was that... Do you know what? To... Dairy milk won, but oh, I thought yeah. Toblerone people might. I, I did this live last night in Yorkshire and Toblerone won and there was just fury. Mm. in the hall i mean they went crazy i yeah. love to is it the new brexit tablerine the um, new yeah the, yeah the one that looks like a bike rack because okay. i made it much smaller yes. uh brexit by the way would be a very good name for a chocolate bar I don't know what it'd be like, but it would have it's two. Fun. It would have two fingers, and it's up to you what you do with them. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I did that, and I thought, well, people would always complain to so, us. So I set up a load of them, put them all in a book, so people can play them at home and ruin their uh, ruin their Christmases. Essentially, just a whole series of arguments for British people to have. We got best chocolate bar, best British sitcom, best British band. We got our favourite American. I've teamed up the 32 most famous Americans, and you have to guess who your favourite American is. Interesting. I mean, uh, it, it is because I looked at the book, and it's actually it is fun and you know how much i like playing games it will drive right? you crazy so yeah. I, th I think we could have fun with it if i had it to come up with a category to play i probably would pick favorite british food so richard favorite british food yes so richard That's hard. could you host an abridged version of the world cup of everything right here right now mm. and just before we do, whilst you're figuring out what you're going to ask us. Oh, right, us, you haven't got the candidates. Um... <laughs> That's the whole thing. You need 32 candidates oh, is the... Uh... All right, well, so we'll I can do, we'll I do can, like a, a, a mini version. Yeah. Um, but just before we start debating it, callers, I want to hear from you. Um, what's your favourite British food? Is it bangers and mash, fish and chips? Perhaps you're partial to spotted dick. Whatever it is, <laughs> join the debate and call me toll free on 877-974-7487. Tweet me on SXM Insight or share your thoughts on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash Narina Hertz. Richard, mm -hmm. over to you. Okay, we'll do. Well, let's, let's have four quarterfinals and I'll take them from very different categories. Mm -hmm. We'll start with, as you say, those sort of big meals that British people love to have bangers and mash, which uh, for Americans, that's sausages and mashed potatoes. So mm -hmm. bangers and mash or fish and chips. Mm -hmm. Um, with fish, fish and, and chips, chips, we have heavily battered fish and chips for fish me. Fish chips every, every day time. Of the week. No, deep no. fried. Don't like the deep fry. I would bangers. go for bangers mash, sausage no, and no. mash. Bangers. Don't say bang. Oh <laughs> yeah. my goodness, no. bangers no. Fish and fish and chips with ketchup. Have no, you been to the Kefton sausage? Excuse me. <laughs> 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 We're not in the Antarctic now, <laughs> <laughs> bangers. Bangers and mash, definitely. yeah, with yeah. a bit of HP sauce. Mm. You don't have HP wow, sauce. I don't think in the States. I'm shocked by that. But it's a kind of tangy. God, you learn. You learn something about I had I had 11 years without proper English sausages and proper English bacon and coming back was oh, bacon thing. you can't yeah, but you can't bring bacon, bacon into it. we're not talking about bacon well, 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 we, sausages, okay, sausage, purely on sausage and mash here sausage and mash yeah. wins hands down yeah. on, for yeah. me okay yeah. okay well listen that okay. goes through the semi-finals and it's what I'll do um uh, two chips because over here mm. in the rest of the world America especially they don't do chips properly they mm. do not do what we call crisps properly they just don't do it uh, right. well, we have all sorts of ridiculous kind of maize based ones so I'm going to say my uh, I'm going to say frazzles Ooh. Now that's a kind of Ooh. that's a. I don't even know what frazzles. Yes, are. you do. No, I don't. What's they frazzles? look like they look like you don't know frazzles. No. You don't know frazzles. What are frazzles? That is unbelievable, and you expect to play Scrabble against me. Uh, frazzles, <laughs> they spell frazzles. They're sort of a bacon-based snack, but they they are they they're kosher. They're vegetarian, so you can have them. Or what's it? I think it's a very strange food for a Jew to eat. What's it? Uh, <laughs> like cheesy puffs, aren't they? Yeah. Like? What's it? What's cheesy, it's puffs? cheesy puffs? Like a better version of a Cheeto. Cheetos, oh, like Cheetos. Mm, okay. Yeah, but better. Uh, well, well, they are. Well, I mean, with respect, we're going to get onto chocolate in a minute, and then the Americans are really in trouble. Yeah. Okay, so what's so it? frazzles or what's what's it? it? Come on, what's it? Cheesy puffs, 
cheesy puffs, definitely. I like how they melt in your mouth. Exactly. So Beth's got... giving this one a lot of thought. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of either. Oh, really? Oh, what, what happens if you don't have one that you feel... Well, that's okay, because it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a majority. It's like Brexit. Not everyone voted. That's okay. You know. But shouldn't there be flavours? Cheese and onion versus salt and vinegar? No, we've Four got cocktail. the categories. They're all in there as we well. They're all in there as well. Categories. But, you know, again, I, 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 I talk to people about what their favourite flavour crisp is. And, you know, we cheer for salt and vinegar. We cheer for salt cheese and, and onion. Shake. But then, you know, some people cheer for ready salted. And that's, that's not even a flavour. No. Oh, I understand what you're that's saying. That's like saying your favourite flavour ice cream is sugar flavoured. No, that's um, not. We'll right. go to chocolate. Now, the Americans okay. can't do chocolate. I'm really sorry, Americans, but you, the rest of the world agrees with this. It's true, they can't. They can't. The Brits can do it. The Swiss can do it. The Belgians can do it. Uh, any African countries, the Caribbean countries can do it. The Americans, uh, due to Hershey's and the, the, the history of American chocolate, are unable to do it. So I would say the two greatest British chocolate inventions mm. are the dairy milk mm. and the Maltesers. Oh, great, yes. great questions. Oh, yes. Great questions. So Maltesers, that's a kind of less sweet, creamier version of Whoppers, isn't it? Uh, you, well, say? I'm afraid you you're at, you have me at a disadvantage. Yeah, I think but it it's is. A, it's, well, it's, a, it's a kind of multi-ball. Yeah, multi -ball. it's a multi -ball. Like little balls, yeah. multi covered, covered, in covered in chocolate. In chocolate. Yeah. yeah, they're really good. The Americans do have a version of them which are not Whoppers. which are not good. No, um, which are not good. I would go for Maltesers. Mm. I like Maltesers. I think you I can suck them slowly in, so you have two different sensations you get from them. Mm. Dairy milk, very nice, um, but I would go Maltesers. Maltesers, hands but, down. But dairy milk is the basis of so many other great bars, like Twitter yeah, bars. True. Can I just say, nice bars. Oh. So I think, it, you know... We've got to speed Can up. I just yeah. say that Ab Diaz is on Facebook says that he thinks fish and chips should win. Well, we, well. we agree with you, my friend. Me yeah. and very much. <laughs> smart on your side. guy, smart guy. You need to buy this book. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> my fourth quarter final <laughs> will go with biscuits or cookies, the Americans will say. And I will say a jammy dodger, Ooh. which is a sort of a biscuit that's got a kind of a heart of jam and cream in the middle, mm. and the Jaffa cake, uh, Ooh. which Ooh. is um, chocolate, chocolate and orange. sponge yeah. and kind of an Ooh. orangey bit in the middle, which is an absolute British classic. Ooh. I'm not sure they have them in the States I, at all. No, but I think there's a, is there a Pepperidge Farm cookie that is that has got orange in, in it? Marina, in you could work for Whole Foods or someone. You're <laughs> I, got in such, I got in it's such trouble on, knowledge on, of on Twitter for calling a Jaffa cake a, a, a biscuit. People said it was a cake. It is a biscuit. Uh, yeah. Jaffa they said, cake, yeah, they said of, it's got the little like cake in the name. Jelly. It's like a yeah, yeah, orange yeah. jelly. I go Jaffa cake. I'm going I would Jaffa go cake. Jaffa cake. Okay, we've got two semi-finals. We're going to go bangers and mash against what's it? Ooh, oh, I'm mixing the categories. This, oh, this is a... you got what is food? Oh, oh, food. Okay. food. Oh. Bangers and mash. Bangers and mash. I think. Bangers and mash. What's it for me? Uh, I go what's it? Uh, we bangers really? and mash. Would you really? Would you really? Bangers yeah. and mash. Of course. Yeah, I've got a love of what's it. Uh, and we'll go Jaffa cake against Maltesers. Oh, that's a tough Maltesers one. Maltesers for me. I'm going Maltesers. Maltesers. Okay, yeah. and we have our final. This is the best British food. Wow. If you're coming over to the UK, this is the first thing to get at the airport. You can get both of these at the airport, but we're only going to allow you to have one of them. Yeah. And it is either A, bangs and mash, or B, Maltesers. We're wow. going to take this one by one, I think. Danny. Well, I think you have to go Maltesers. I think it's the right choice. I mm. think they'll be definitely available at the airport, at Heathrow oh, or anywhere you land. Them, I don't know whether you can get that at the airport. So I, 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 think, I, yeah. I, I back Maltesers. Maltesers, Beth. Oh, it's tough, but I'm going to go for Bangers and Mash. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I literally, I would have killed Ooh. you after 14 months yeah. in Antarctica. Yeah. I'm a big fan. Are you worried about the quality of the bangers and mash at the airport if you're walking? I in? So am concerned. Like they sell the whiskey and the, yeah. and, the, and, the, and the perfumes and you've got bangers and mash. Yes. But I probably <laughs> wouldn't free, go. Wouldn't yeah, yeah. yeah. Cold bang yeah, I'd go for the Maltesers. Uh, Matt's going Maltesers, Norina. I'm I'm going Maltesers. Oh, 3 no. one. I'm going to go Maltesers as well. It's a 4 1 <laughs> victory for Maltesers. It's a sweet. Yes. So any American, that's your best British food, is wow. the Maltesers. I don't think that's far wrong. No. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think we chose well. Richard, is there something quintessentially British mm. about these heated arguments over potato chips or chocolate bars? I hope so. You know, I, genuinely, there is there is sort of some meaning behind it, which is I, I find social media, Twitter and all that kind of thing, I, I, I don't like the argumentative nature of it. I don't like the divisive nature of it. I don't mm. like people being set up against each other the whole time. I don't like left and right arguing the whole time. And this was, you know, I do these over kind of bank holiday weekends. These are our uh, public public holidays. Public holiday weekends. And so you sort of three or four days of these arguments and people go crazy about them but it doesn't matter at all people have fun with them they have a laugh with them and they say there's betting on them uh, and you know people you know have huge feuds about them uh, but it says you know what you're allowed to argue with each other you're allowed to go crazy we seem to have lost the ability to argue with each other these days we seem to have lost the ability to accept that other people have different opinions to us but argue and, in a kind of warm fun way but to argue to accept that someone else has a completely different opinion to you 
but that they're still your mum. But did you get any, <laughs> tra- any <laughs> did anyone troll you on Twitter when you said, you know, you announced the winner, you know, the oh, bands of mass lobby on Twitter but going tro- you. But you know, like, like, like parody of trolling. That was the lovely <laughs> thing. It was taking the mick out of trolls. Yeah. You know, that's a be- that, that was the lovely thing about it. So it's, it, they're very stressful when I do them. So it takes <laughs> a remarkable of, 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 of admin. But as I say, they, they raise a huge amount of money for, 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 for Child's Eye. So, and they were great fun. So this Christmas, I've still got, I've got, um, we're doing Christmas songs. This Christmas, oh. World Cup. we did. We were the World Cup of Christmas films last Christmas, oh. and the final was Home Alone versus Elf. Oh, oh. oh. Yeah. I mean, really? tell me about That's it. Good. Who won? Really? Who won? Uh, Home Alone won. Home Alone. Well, yeah. It's a Wonderful Life. Or knocked it's out a Wonderful Life. Knocked out in the quarterfinals. Quarterfinals. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. I would go. Love Actually, Love Actually got quarterfinals as well. Okay. That did very well. But we even had like Die Hard and stuff in there. That counts as a Christmas, Christmas movie. movie? Yeah, okay. yeah. Now you are Britain's most popular quiz show host, and mm. I love. Hey, the Americans don't know any better. Okay. I love quizzes. Um, so what makes a great quiz player? A great quiz player? I just yes. think you have to be interested in stuff. You know, that's, that's, you know if, you, if you're genuinely interested in the world, people often say when someone knows a lot about science or geography, they go, yeah, but I bet they don't know about, you know, pop music and stuff. And you go, no, no, that, they know about that as well. Okay. If you're someone who's interested in the world, you know about stuff. And we get people who don't know about history. You'll give them a pop music question. They don't know about that either because, you know, you like stuff or you don't like stuff, I think is the truth. And if you have the sort of brain that enjoys learning and that retains things that's all you really need to be a bit a, a quiz show player you need to be interested is the, is the is the truth that's the secret and why do you think viewers like watching quizzes so much because quizzes get high ratings don't they in, in, gosh in the uk yeah it's crazy well in the us as well if you look at the syndicated shows um well firstly you know it's a it's a sense of competitiveness it's a it's a it's that it was the first sort of real interactive form of television we're endlessly told we need interactive entertainment and two screen entertainment and stuff and that's what a quiz show has always been it's always you shout out an answer um at the television and secondly in the uk and in the us as well because of the kind of high volume the way you can make a quiz show and the way you can film them they are scheduled daily and they become part of people's routine and they become part of people's lives and so whilst they're answering the questions you also uh the personalities who present them become part of people's routine and part of people's families and you know become you know very very familiar friends and i think that combination of things uh that thing of feeling like you're slightly smarter than you were before you started watching mm. and feeling that there's a friend in the corner of your living room, I think is quite a seductive thing for people. And also you play along with a mm. quiz, don't you, when you're, when you're watching and then if you get one right, you feel so jubilant. Mm. <laughs> it well, doesn't matter that you got kind of 10 wrong. But Well, the biggest show on, on one of our channels here, it's BBC Two, is, uh, is University Challenge, which in the States is College Bowl. Is that what that is? Yeah. Have you done? I I, I've been on the, the celebrity, celebrity. Oh, on the celebrity one, oh, and celebrity it's one, yeah. it's it's the biggest rating show, and no one ever answers any questions right on that because they're impossible. You know, you sort of guess, and it, as soon as it's a maths question, you say minus one. <laughs> and as soon as it's classical music, you say Tchaikovsky, and yeah. hope for the best. No one can get anything right, and yet that's the most popular People show like on the channel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now you're not only the host of um, really popular quiz shows; you're also the creator mm. of game and quiz shows. I'm interested, which shows translate well to the United States? Well, it's, well, I tell you, I mean, look, game shows obviously doing Weakest Think and Millionaire and all that kind of stuff have, have been over, and we do a show called Million Pound Drop, which was uh, which was big in the states, and and reality shows do Big Brother and you know Survivor was um, that was one of mine, and that's that's a huge hit. Mm-hmm. But um, it's interesting the shows that don't translate as the truth. The US, for example, has a real tradition of late night talk. You know, the hugest of the biggest stars in the States are late night talk show hosts. And we've tried it time and time and time and time again, daily talk shows in the UK, and they never work. They why never why work. do you think that is? Though? Do you know what? I don't know why it is, but I wonder if it's something to do with the fact that alternatively we we have a thing called panel shows mm. so we have a th- we have a show called have i got news for you we've got would i lie to you which is these things where you get four or five comedians together they talk through the week's news they have a laugh with each other you play a game and then at the end you know the points don't really matter but that's what we play mm. and now we piloted those are huge hits in the uk huge hits and you pilot them again and again and again in the states and they never work there so whether we take our topical news and our, what we do with our comedians we put them in a silly game Mm. And the Americans make them slightly more newsy and slightly more an anchor sitting behind a desk and telling the us about the news. Because Americans like sat- political satire, mm. Saturday Night mm. Live. Yeah. So it's not that they don't like comedians talking yeah. about newsy subjects. I mean, have I got news for you, which has been going 25 series over here. And it's a mm. proper staple. You know, a Friday night on the BBC, it's a huge hit, has been for a really long time. And they piloted that five or six times in the States with different talent. You know, years ago, I remember Norm MacDonald doing one. They, time and time and time again, they try it. And it never, ever goes, mm. which is really peculiar. 
Danny, you must know that. Down yeah, I, I, absolutely right. And I, I've wondered that question as well about why some of those, why uh, talk shows, late night talk shows haven't worked here. I, I think there is a deeper writing pool probably in the States. Yeah, so. I think there's probably more money in mm. to produce it. I think the range of guests you can get mm. is is broader. Um, yeah, also, those shows are on sh- quite late. And they have a movie, st- every week there's movies, movies coming out. There are movie yeah. stars available to yeah. come on. and, and So we can manage mm. one of those a week. Our mm. biggest sort of talk show host like that is graham norton yeah. here and we can manage that once a week but i think every night is harder it's all, weird, isn't it? all of you richard danny beth matthew um thank you so much that's all we've got time for this week i'm afraid thank you all so much for coming on you can stay in touch with our guests on twitter at richard osman at matt garahan at beth a healy at danny cohen I have really loved this show. It's been fun as well as stimulating and enlightening. And thanks to you for listening and sharing your views. If you're just tuning in and want to catch the rest of the show, check us out on demand. This is Megahertz London Calling.